one uh, believer that came from um, uh, actually a Muslim background told me that um, before I became a Christian, I had community. Now I have meetings. So what does it mean like to be a community of Christians out there in the marketplace? Uh, we've moved from, from being a community of people who live under Christ's authority to people who just have regular meetings. And the meetings seem to take us away from our engage, engagement with the world rather than equipping us to engage with the world in ways that transform the world. I've met many pastors who have been captured by the big and robust vision of the Bible that all of life matters, all work matters, and all of human existence is an opportunity to glorify God and reflect His image. The theology that we've been talking about throughout this series. But it's often challenging to know how to develop the skills to disciple your people well in their vocations and occupations. Vocational discipleship is like a muscle. And oftentimes we need practices and exercises to strengthen ourselves in the ability to serve our congregants well. So today I want to share just a couple of exercises that pastors can implement into their lives that will help them understand the work of their congregants and know how to, to serve them. The first one is to visit the places where your congregants work. I cannot stress enough how important this is. Abraham Kuyper said, as, as Daryl referenced earlier, that there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And therefore, the offices and the workspaces that are occupied by your, the people in your congregation, those places are, are holy places. That They are places of holy ground, whether it's a dentist's office or a gas station or a hospital or a park. And it encourages those in our congregation when we visit them and leave the doors of our church and go to their place and take a posture of a learner to pray in that place, to learn both the beauties and the brokenness that they encounter every day. We affirm them when we visit them and tour their places of work, and it helps us understand them. This can also be crucial for preparing classes and preparing sermons. I found no better place to prepare a sermon on compassion than a hospital. No better place to reflect on power than sitting at an airport or sitting in, a, in an auto mechanic's garage as you hear the power tools going on in the background. In this context, we understand the real life that people are going through and it makes its way into our sermons. The second practice would be to pray for the occupations and vocations of those in our congregation. And that may sound obvious, but I really believe that prayer, our prayer life, is usually the last frontier of dualism that often will have a good theology and will speak with uh, a, a rich and robust worldview. But when we go to pray, our prayer lives only focus on the spiritual things, not the social and the physical as well. So usually what I do as a practice is I'll take a few people each week that I'll pray for. I'll, I'll send them an email, ask for any prayer requests, but I will, I will pray along the contours of the biblical story. So take a nurse, for example. With creation, I will reflect on creation and I will praise God for the goodness, the truth, and the beauty that is displayed in her work, the ways in which she reflects God's character. And then also the fall, I will mourn the pain that she sees on a daily basis, the physical brokenness and death that she has to encounter and the, the physical effects of the fall. With redemption, I will praise Jesus for how he is good news, how his physical body was broken so that one day bodies won't be broken anymore. And consummation, I pray with her with longing for the day that will come where, when God makes all things new. And I use the biblical story as the framework through which to pray for people in their various occupations and vocations. This helps us keep our, our prayers big and robust and not just limited and dualistic. The third is uh, learning about their industry. Uh, we can't be an expert in every industry, but we can become conversant. 
and this fuels our prayers and it affirms their work when we learn something about what they do. So pick up journals and magazines, do Google searches, but take the time to really learn what they do. Ask good questions, listen instead of uh, being quick to speak. And even I would encourage you to, to read your local newspaper and understand something about the economy that people are experiencing on a, on a daily basis, especially the local realities that, that they are experiencing. Number four is learn from other uh, institutions and organizations and churches that have already, uh, are already implementing this in their churches or teaching in some very rich ways. To name just a few, one would be the Made to Flourish Network, which is a, a network of churches who are really committed to faith, work, and economics and discipling their congregations to think deeply about that. The Washington Institute for Faith, Vocation, and Culture, uh, the Redeemer Center for Faith and Work. And, so, and you need to, to fill your library with important books like Life Work by Daryl Miller, uh, Visions of Vocation by Steve Garber, Vo um, Kingdom Calling by Amy Sherman, and Work Matters by Tom Nelson. These, these books will be on your library, in your library and will help you greatly. And number five, imagination is more important than information. We can often communicate principles to people within our congregations, but those principles don't always get reimagined into their daily work. What I mean by that is someone can believe that work is good, but not necessarily have reconceived or reimagined their work as an act of gardening in God's world or reflecting his image or pushing back against the effects of, of the fall. Some examples of this would be, I once met with an architect. He felt like his work was drudgery because he was building a bridge in a city that was far away and all, all the bridge was doing was uh, cutting down a little bit of commute time within that city. And he struggled to see the, the, the value of his work and how it fit into to God's purposes. But then when we talked through what he was doing, we realized that that bridge would cut off a few minutes of each person's commute each day. And that the sum total of all the time that would be saved in the city was 5,000 hours every week. And he saw his work now as instead of just creating or helping make a bridge in a random city, but giving 5,000 hours of work, of productivity, of shalom, of family time back to that city. Or uh, my, friend, uh, my friend who worked as a server, she worked as a server and she didn't find a lot of meaning in her work and see how it fit within Genesis 1 and 2 until we sat down and read Genesis 2.15 about how God placed Adam in the garden to work and to keep it. And eventually she began to reimagine the 10 tables that she was in charge of, not as this this waste of her time, but as God's tables, as the part of God's garden that he had given her to cultivate. And by sitting down with people and helping them reimagine their work in light of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, we can serve them greatly and help them work well for the glory of God. I want to close with just a story that highlights the importance of this. Last year, in my home, we noticed that there was a crack in the ceiling. We had purchased the home from someone who clearly did not have a biblical worldview and had done very poor work on the home to where it looked nice on the outside, but there were significant problems. We brought in some contractors to take a look at that work and every contractor came in and said, your family is in danger. They took out a load bearing wall and did not brace it co correctly and your house could collapse in on itself. The point that all of the weight was holding was over my daughter's play area. She was four years old at the time. She's on the autism spectrum and the poor work of someone else put this precious image bearer in danger. But there was one contractor, there was one guy who came over and he said, you do not have to hire me for the job. You do not have to pay me anything for what I'm about to do now, but I will not leave this house without putting up a temporary wall 
because your family is in danger. So I'm not asking permission. I'm telling you, this is what I'm going to do. And he built this temporary wall to protect my family. And I had never experienced such a sense of God's protection through the work of another. I had never seen such excellence in, in work as, as I had seen in his. And as I was asking him questions about himself, it turns out that he went to a local church nearby and that he had been taught a rich theology of work. And it was his commitment to Christ, and his commitment to protecting the lives of those who reflect God's image and of doing his work with excellence, which made him do that that day. And as he did that, it, it was one of the most beautiful demonstrations of work I had ever seen. And as pastors, we can do work with excellence like that to serve people and to fill cities with people who do work like that.